OK, we are back. And we want to try to improve this uh, stupid application with some uh, sort of user interaction. Uh, so right now, what we, know, what we are able to do is to define pages and uh, return a given HTML template uh, with some uh, inserted values that will replace uh, the placeholder. Then what we could do, uh, we will be back, we will we'll come back to the last. What we can do is to add some uh, sort of user interaction to the web page. So imagine the user could enter their name on a page and then having uh, at the second page that whose, uh, whose content will depend or will contain or will uh, in some way take into account uh, the username. Stupid idea, uh, I want to log in to the website. So I need to provide a name and a password. And then the next page, if the password is correct, is the login successful, will print my name somewhere and give the content of the website. Otherwise, it will need to give me an error. So it will uh, generate a different page. Hmm? So web pages are not just uh, you know, dependent on the URL, on the request. They depend, of course, on what the request is from the browser, but also from the values of some data that is provided by the user. So for example, we can modify our example huh, by allowing the user here to insert their name and compute the secret value depending on that name so that the second page will be different depending on the name of the user, hmm? for example. So how can we allow a user to enter a value in a web page? So the home page is here, sorry, the home page is here. I want to change it uh, to read, uh, to see the secret value, enter your name. And I let the user enter the name. So that I can process and compute the number based on the name, right? So I change this page to see the secret value, enter your name. And, uh, sorry, slash A, you see, thanks to the syntax checking. He, what are the HTML constructs? primitive text uh, that allow user interaction. They are all under the form tag. So I can, sorry, the form should be embedded into a paragraph. All user interaction is encoded in HTML, at least the, easy, the, the easiest part of a form or user interaction are embedded into a form. Form in HTML is a tag that contains controls. What are controls? Controls are input controls, text areas, buttons, checklists, um, drop down menus, groups of, of options to select, uh, and so on. So there is a whole set of tags in HTML that are used uh, to create forms that the user can interact with. So every form is contained into the master form tag. And inside the form, we may have many elements of, of different types. Okay? Again, if you go to the W3Schools website, uh, You have uh, all the forms and input uh, tags, and it will tell you what they do. For example, the input tag can 
let the user input different type of data that's the type uh, uh, is, a, is used uh, the input HTML tag uh, is used to generate buttons checkboxes uh, uh, text uh, fields uh, radio buttons and so on so various type uh, of input elements on the on the page and uh, the user can enter a value inside this input element so actually uh, what we should do here is to so where is that uh, for the, okay to create a, a paragraph for example with an input so I say name semicolon input type type uh, text And what happens in this case? I only wrote name input type equal to text. It translates into this name is the text that I have here. It's outside the input element. And the input tag itself translates into this text area, text uh, field. Then, okay, so I, the form element itself is invisible. Doesn't change the page in any way. It's only used as a delimiter of the portion of the error that contains the control. Basically, it's only used because you could have many forms to in the page, and so you need to define which controls to belong uh, to which form. Hmm? And the actual interaction elements uh, are, um, are defined especially with these elements. And uh, another could be input type uh, submit. Submit is an input element uh, that contains the submit button, okay? Because you need to confirm your data. So this is a very minimal form here. That does nothing. Does nothing because we didn't instruct the HTML what to do with this form. Of, of course, we can customize it. We can improve it. For example, instead of uh, in via query or the name uh, of uh, what the browser puts into the button, you can define what you want the button to read. Value is uh, go, for example. And so the value attribute of a submit button so is uh, changes changes the content, the label of the button itself. But it's just aesthetics. Huh? So we can change the white of the of the elements, the color, whatever. But we still don't know what to do when the user clicks on the go button. And to specify what happens when the user selects a form? We need uh, first to tell the page what are or which are the data that we are interested in. We are interested in the text that the user types into this first input element. So since we are interested in this text, uh, we must give it a name in order to be able to retrieve it. Otherwise, if imagine we have 20 different input elements, uh, which is which? So for identifying a given input value, a given value entered by the user, you should give a name to every element which is significant to you, which is useful to you. <coughs> the name could be the username. This is just a, a label, just a string username but just we name the input element after an identifier that we want to use uh, to refer to the value entered by the user this is an example 
which is uh, which happens always in the web technologies and in most of the programming we are handling with a general mechanism for passing values for identifying values with a key value attribution so we are we have a name username for this input element and the value which is not known because the value is, is entered by the user so every element or most of, el of the input elements have two, these two attributes names name and value the value is the actual content of the element the name is the identifier that you associated that so a form the content of a form is nothing more than a list of name value pairs name value other name of another, another input uh, element the value entered into that element and so on everything in the web technologies are lists uh, of uh, name value pairs we already saw that even in the in the, in here in the templates we have a name and we have a value so we always ap apply this pattern of thinking here I don't specify sorry, the value because the value needs to be provided by the user. If I specify the value here, this value would be the initial value of the text area. But as soon as I modify, the user modifies this, the value attribute will change. So value is always the runtime representation of the current content of a given element. For the button, we only gave value, we didn't give the name. Why? Well, because a button is not an element that the user can write into, can change the value. The value we need to provide it in the page is not something the user inputs. And I don't need a name because there's no data associated with that button. So there's no data that they could retrieve using that name so it's just an aesthetics yeah having a nice label hmm? so right now we we marked uh, this input as with the label or with the name username so we marked which are the data that we are interested in the username so the first half of the work is uh, identifying which data we want to retrieve. The second half of the work is uh, deciding who's, gonna, who's going to process this data. So when the user clicks on the submit button, the browser will pack all the data that have a name specified and what, and will send them to a web page onto an HTTP request, packing them into an HTTP request message. What is the page target of this message? So actually clicking on the go button is equivalent to making a web request to a given address. An address of a page that will be able to process this data to store them, to check them, to validate them, to print them, whatever. So we have one page where the user can enter the data and a different page that whose, whose goal is to process the data, to act on the data. In fact, the name of the attribute here is action. Action is the name of the web page that will receive this data. In our case, it would be secret. And the second attribute is method. So the form you know, uh, pulls together all the elements and when the user clicks on the submit button, 
takes all the values and sends them to the specified action, to the specified URL. It can do that, it will do that, of course, with an HTTP call. And it could be done with two different mechanisms. There are two different commands in the HTTP protocol, get and post. Up to now, we only work with get. No? You remember those get command by down here. Get is useful for getting a single page, getting a resource. There is also a mechanism for uh, providing data in a GET request. And this data is appended, you see the syntax down here, which is only partial because I didn't write anything. But with a question mark, uh, username equal value, the value is empty here. So when you request a page with a GET method in HTTP, you can also append some parameters, some values to this get request. Is it, you, it can be useful. Actually, we don't like it too much because in the URL of the browser, then we will see this pollution of a different uh, parameter name. So normally, when we create a form, we use the other method, the post method, that doesn't show the arguments in the title, in the, the URL bar, but it you know, hides them and calls them into the uh, HTTP request body. We will see more about the HTTP protocol later when we learn about uh, uh, the server-to-server um, -server interaction. So we'll learn uh, much better about the difference between get and post and so on. For now, we should be happy by saying Forms uh, are usually sent uh, with the post method. If you, that, if you do that with get, uh, then the Python code will be different for, for enabling them. You can do that, but it's a, it's a corner case. The normal case here. What do you want here? That's something. This yellow, oops, too much. Do you like it here? Yes. Uh, okay. Let's forget about the label for the moment. So right now we have this page. Where I can write my name and click go. If I click go, you see that the browser tries to call the secret page. I'm getting an error. Why am I? Well, simply because uh, the secret page is expecting a get call. And right now, I'm sending a post call to that page. And so it generates an error. So I should specify that since secret.html is expected to process the data from a form, it should be called with the method post. Method equal post. So we are specifying that the routing should be done for post requests, uh, or if we want, uh, it could be done both for get and post. By default, we, if you don't specify methods, uh, it will only route get requests. If you specify the methods parameter, you can list uh, which are the HTTP methods that will be routed by this uh, call. Okay, so in our case, uh, we only need post, so we delete get. But you can list more than one. That's why methods is plural, and it requests a list. You see the branch, it's not just a string, list of strings. So right now, post. If you go back and try it again, it 
shouldn't crash anymore. Of course, it doesn't do anything with my name, you know, because there's not, we, we don't have any code for doing that. But the data is sent to the server. Let me know. The data is sent, uh, that the data that the user inserted on the home page is being sent uh, to the hello function that is implementing the secret HTML URL. How can this page retrieve this data? The data are in the HTTP request. Right? So there is an, uh, an object called uh, request in Flask. So I'm importing also a request from Flask that contains all the information about the incoming request. What is that? If you see the API, incoming request here, you see that uh, you have a, an object called a request that contains various information about the specific request. For example, one, we already touched it, is the method. Was this request called with a get or with a post? We don't see, we didn't see the use it, but URL of the request. Or form. Form is a, an, a property of the request object that contains the data extracted from the user request. So in this case, we can say that the username, Python variable, can be retrieved from the request object, in particular the post, that's the form data, corresponding to the object whose name is username. So, what's happening? In the home page, I have an input called the username. So, we have a, a, a couple a pair, name, value pair. Name is a username, value is a what I write, what the user writes. This uh, name value pair is being sent through a post HTTP request to this page, secret. And here the page is extracting from the request data the input, the value, of the input element whose name is username. And is putting that into a Python variable that by chance I also called username. I could call it in any way, don't care. So what the, the items that should match are the name of the input element here and the, the key of the dictionary that we use uh, to retrieve that element, the index. Huh? So I'm retrieving the value that the user entered on a different page on that specific input element with this name. And so you can do what you want. So the secret value, in this case, it's a very complex computation, cryptographic computation of my name, username dot Type. Type? No, sorry. Uh, length. Length. What is the Python for the length of a string? Sorry. Length. Hmm? Could be. Length. Length with. Like this. Ah, okay. Le okay, thank you. Sorry. I, I'm doing a, a Java course in the morning and a Python in the afternoon, so uh, it happens. 
Right, thank you. And so the secret value would be the length of the username. We could also uh, make the, um, the template even nicer by passing the username. So that in the page you can also print your name. Uh, beware the syntax. Username equal username, what does it mean? This username here refers to this variable. This username there, on the left, is the name of the placeholder that I'm expecting to find in the HTML template. So the placeholder called username will be filled with the current value of the variable username. You need to, even if the name is the same, you need to specify it because you are talking about two different types. So in secret, you can say, uh, welcome, Mr. Username. Your secret value is secret value. So let's try, restart the application, grab the browser, go to home, okay, to see the secret value, enter your name. My name is Fulvio. Welcome, Mr. Fulvio. Your secret value is six. But if uh, my name were Bob, my secret value would be different, it would be three. Strong cryptography here. Hmm? See what we mean by dynamic web pages. They are web pages whose content depends on the current input. And what if the user is lazy and just clicks go without filling his name? I don't want to say this. I should show an error, not this one. So the logic of the web page here, after retrieving the length of your username, should do different things according to the length, for example. So if the value is zero, then return a different template. Otherwise, okay, good. Uh, sorry, let me call. So if the user didn't enter a name, I'm generating an error page. If the user did enter a name, so the value is greater than zero, we can provide a secret number to them. And of course, we need uh, an error page defined as a template. And the uh, body of uh, should be, for example, error. You must provide a name in, you must provide a name. Try again. And try again would be a link to the home page right 
So it's just a static page. It doesn't change. It doesn't depend on the user input, even because we don't have any user input. We forgot to provide one. But it fills the, uh, closes the circle. So let's try again. Empty page. To see the secret value, enter your name, as I said, Fulvio. And then that would be six. If I try again, and this time I'm lazy and don't enter any value, I click go, and I get, in this case, an error page. You must provide the name. And we try again, I go back to the home page. Uh, just notice one detail. We know that this template comes from the error.html template, this page. But it's still called the secret.html here. Okay? Why? Because secret.html is, uh, uh, where is that? Is the name, the URL of the page. Then the fact that the secret.html renders a template or another template is just an internal. We call then this. We could call this template it's in template A B C D dot HTML, and it doesn't change. We don't care. Okay. The visible part of the navigation of the website is uh, the set of routes uh, that we defined. The visible part. The addresses that the user used to navigate. Okay? So, this is a piece by piece and step by step, uh, these are the basic ingredients that we use to create web applications. Um, so we can let the user input a value. We can um, intercept that value, use it to modify a page, and so on. And decide the navigation path of the user depending dynamically on the value that have been entered. So what I would like to do now is, for example, add another page <coughs> later. So this is the welcome page. And so since I have my secret value, I can go ahead and see my secret data. Imagine that. So I want to make an, another page with my secret data. So that will be easy. We modify the secret page, your secret value is, and then we go, we add an, another link for see your private secret data. Huh? It's easy. It will be just a link. To another page that we need to create. We still have half an hour. Creating a page would be easy. Except it is not. It would be another page uh, URL for, uh, how do we call it? Data. So we need to create another page that we call data. Go to the Python, we define a new route for a URL that we can call uh, secret data dot HTML app dot route. Sorry. Define data. And then return uh, Render template uh, of uh, data.html. And uh, 
maybe in this template we want to provide uh, also the username and uh, the, the secret data. Okay, the secret data, we, we can fake it. We don't have it. So, it's an, an array of very secret numbers. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one. Hmm? You know them. Of course, uh, in the reality should depend uh, should be user dependent this is just fake data we need to improve it uh, probably we will have a database that will store the secret data for uh, for every for every user right and so we can have a template that we show this data. But my problem is now the user. I need the username to print it into the page. More than that, I need the username to query the database for getting the right data for that specific user. Right. Do I have that data, that information? So let's, let's have a look at what I did uh, in the previous function. In the previous function, the username was retrieved from the request form. Why? Because in the previous page, there was a form in which the user entered their name. Right now, the secret data Uh, what did I do wrong? Oh, okay, because there's <coughs> sorry. Otherwise, I get error. So here, enter my name to this page. Your private secret data. If I click on this link. This is just a normal link. It's not a form. So that link will not bring the user data to the next page into the HTTP request. It's just a link. So how can the website, the server, remember my name? So imagine a website in which after you log in, immediately after you log in, it forgets your name. That wouldn't be very useful with input. But that is the, this is the nature of, a, of the HTTP protocol. HTTP is a protocol without memory. The server is expected to reply to a given request just by, uh, just with the information that is embedded in that specific request. It doesn't remember the request that you did one millisecond before. It doesn't, by design. There's no way. So HTTP doesn't remember that one second ago you already gave the name. When, when you call this function, hello, it works with local variables, but these variables will be forgotten when you return. Don't even try to store them in the class. Don't even try to say, okay, I'm cheating. I'm storing the, I, de I define a new variable here, e no, no, none. And then I make a secret copy of the username into this variable. So that I can remember it later.
What's the difference between this variable and that variable? It's the scope of the variable. This is defined inside the function. When the function returns, the variable is, is, is destroyed. This is defined at the module scope. So it's alive for, all, for the whole duration of the program. So what's wrong with this? We solved our problem. We stored the user into a global variable. Anyone sees the problem? From different users. Yes. The, the issue is that this is not my desktop app application, my Python script. It's a server. And many, imagine, not, uh, there's not just one user here. There will be hundreds of different users. And each user will enter the, their name. And uh, I'm just remembering the last one. Every time a new user comes, I will overwrite this variable and I start using that name. Right? Because there's just one of those variables. The application is one. The u variable, u, u, u variable is one. While the username variable is one per each request. Every request has their own private copy of this variable that can be used consistently inside the web page. A global static variable will be shared by all the applications. Not what, we, not what we want. We don't share the name, our name, our private data just because we are connected to the same website. The website should have a mechanism for remembering private data, or in general, remembering data on a user by user basis. So HTTP doesn't do that because it's not in the design of the protocol. Global variable, no. They don't solve the problem. They create uh, more problems than that. What we need is a mechanism by which, okay, how, how can the web server, if I have three users that are connected to me, I'm the web server, okay? I have three users connecting to me. How can I tell you apart? So you're making a, um, a request uh, name A. You are saying your name is B, your name is C. Okay. One second after, I receive an HTTP request. But I don't remember who you are. I, by the way, I don't even remember that I, that, I, that I exchanged data with you one second ago. So there's no way I can store some information or I can have some information at all that will help me to remember you. I have a trick. My trick is that when you give me your name at the beginning, I, give, I, I will give you a, a small object, a cookie. Why not? And you, but I give you a cookie, but you promise that every time you will come and talk to me to make additional requests, you will show me the cookie that I, get you, that I gave you at the beginning. So that I give different cookies, different objects, different reminders to different users. And every time a user will connect to my website, uh, they will provide me a copy of the data that is written on the cookie that I provided them before. So you are making me a favor. You are storing for me some information that I would forget if it weren't for you. So you are collaborating with my memory. Okay? I'm giving some information to you, saying, please, store this information and give it back to me the next time we meet. Okay, there were many movies about around this topic, right? Remember uh, Finding Nemo? No, we had yeah, the Dory uh, fish that lost her memory. You don't watch movies. Um, okay, so 
the, the solution is to use an extension of the HTTP protocol that are the so-called cookies. Cookies are just little strings of data that the server sends to the browser with the promise that the browser will send it them back identically without modifying them to the server at every later request to the same web server. So in that way, I don't have a storage for your information. Actually, I don't have them in the server, in my pockets. I store them in your pockets. No? Like the person who was afraid of burglars, he was afraid of people stealing his uh, wallet, so he decided to hide his wallet in other people's pockets. So they, won't, they will not store it from him. No? So these are the cookies. I don't trust myself in storing the data. I entrust you, the browser, to store the data that I need for the navigation. This is the low-level mechanism. And we need it every time we need to remember some information that we get intercept in a page, and we need that information later on. In a, uh, in uh, Python or in, in all uh, web uh, frameworks, uh, we have a high-level view of this mechanism that is called uh, session. A session is a, a sort of a storage, a sort of a database where we can store some information on a user-by-user -user basis. And all the framework will do all the dirty work with cookies for storing information, retrieving, checking whether you, are, you have a new cookie, your is expired, and so on. So all the low level about the cookies, we don't see it. We only see a storage uh, memory in a global object that is called session. where we can store, it's a dictionary, so we can store the value that we want inside this object. And the application mechanism will uh, sort of multiplex this dictionary. So when I write session user, I'm using a dictionary, which is the dictionary of your cookie. And later on, session user will be the dictionary associated to your cookie, or his cookie, and so on. So, session is a sort of a global variable that is not shared among all the users. It's a global variable that automatically maps uh, to a specific user. It's specific to uh, every single user. So, that is a place uh, where we can store information about the user. And uh, to enable this uh, mechanism, we need simply, it's already inside Flask, we don't need to do anything special, except defining a string that Flask will use to encrypt the cookies. Okay, because actually I'm entrusting you to store my data. I must protect myself against tampering with that data. I don't want you to modify it. I want you to give the cookie back to me with exactly the same value. So I will sign it with a string, with a cryptographic string, uh, with a password that I only know. Okay, because if, if in the cookie you have uh, maybe the, the debit or the credit of your account uh, against me, the user should not be able to modify that. Otherwise, I will be cheating with my data. Huh? I'm entrusting you to keep my data, and I'm trying to lock the wallet that I'm giving to you so that you cannot modify it. So. We just have to define this secret key, where's PyCharm here, yeah? For example, it's a property of the application with some string that uh, the users could not guess. Do you like it? Anything that should never be made public. 
if you make this public, your, the security of your section is broken. Okay? Different uh, tools uh, use different mechanisms for this, but in Flash it's simple like that. So, by doing this, we, are, we have uh, Flash automatically initializes the sessions for every user. So at this point, we can store the username when we retrieve it. Uh, what is that? Uh, session. Sorry. Session, of course, is uh, an object that must be important. Important. And we store an object named username into the session with the current value of the variable username. And we could also store, if we, if we need it, the value is equal to the value. So this is a normal dictionary. We can uh, add the element, uh, query element, and so on. But this dictionary is multiplexed across the user. So every new request will load the preload the dictionary with the value of that user. And if you modify the dictionary, it will send back an updated cookie with the new values. So at that point, we can retrieve a previously known information from the session. So this is a general mechanism, for example, whenever you do the login mechanism to a website, uh, what the login is actually doing is checking the password and setting a cookie, or initializing a session by storing the username and some information that you get at the login page, I page into the session. And every web page can query the session dictionary and say, okay, is the username defined inside the session? If yes, I can trust that the login was successful. If this key username is not defined in this dictionary, then I'm sure that the login was not successful, was not attempted or was uh, not accepted. And so every page m can know whether the, log the user is logged in or not by querying the session. So we should be careful about which information we store in the session. The session is initialized session dictionary is initialized at the first request from the user. Any value is stored and remembered for the whole duration of the navigation session. When the user closes the browser, the cookie expires. There's also a mechanism for setting par permanent cookies, but we don't go into that today. So does it work? We don't know because we need to create a secret da um, data.html template. So let's create it. Your secret data. So in the title, secret data for user. Username. And the secret data is in the secret data um, list. So at first, then we will prove it. But at first, let's try to dump it just on the page. Of course, I can access the session object even from here. So I could write, I could have written session of user directly here in the uh, placeholder. But I, I prefer cleaner things. So in this case, let's uh, go back to our website. Let's write my name again. See your private secret data. And something is probably wrong because it doesn't respond. Secret data HTML. OK. It, w it was only slow. Secret data for user food. And this word where the data. You see that 
this username was stored in the session and it was retrieved in the session so at that point uh, I could also I should also modify the home page for example because I don't want the home page uh, to have the input name uh, if the name is already defined so this portion inserting the username should only be available if the user is not logged into the system and if it's logged into the system I should uh, I don't provide a logout function for example for destroying the session hmm? we can modify that later but first I wanted to show you a better way of uh, showing this data this is just a dump uh, of a Python list imagine you want to put that into an HTML uh, item list or HTML table how can we do that okay this is a Python object it's a Python structure Python in this case it's a, it's a sequence it's a list and we don't want of course to to break the list down into many different variables we want the template to be able to show the different items on different lines. Okay. So for example, showing the data in a, a number list, which each item is a list item. So it should be one, and the other should be two, and so on. But we, know, we don't know how many. So for example, here we could say, Sorry. Secret data zero. The first element. And then the second, then the third one. But we don't know how many we are we have. So what we could do is uh, we we need to write a for statement here. But we are not in Python. Luckily, we have uh, and we go back here. In the template language there are some control statements available which are which have this strange syntax uh, brace percent sign that we can use to loop across uh, a data structure so this or it conditionally include uh, or not include a portion of the template in the final output so in this case we, what we want to do is to iterate curly brace percent for item in it's in sorry I don't remember the syntax in yeah in a secret data and then we put the item like a four in, in Python the syntax is slightly different we need an n four We need to close the for because in Python we have indentation. In HTML, indentation doesn't count, so we need an explicit closing of the for. So we repeat, we are repeating this line many times, one for each value of this secret data. We are repeating the list item, so the HTML code, and also the, um, the placeholder that will be assigned at every iteration with a new value. So it's easy to list the value. Imagine your to-do list. When you are doing a for to print uh, all the list, all the items in the to-do list, uh, we are we are doing the same here in the HTML page. So, for example, the browser is here. I always lose it. Uh, you see how the data structure is unpacked. Of course, I need to delete the first one. I just kept it for comparison how this uh, uh, the data structure is unpacked uh, so that we can format it uh, in HTML. In this case, it was a list. Uh, it could have been a table, depending on our layout uh, you know, preferences. So the page, the template itself, does have some logic for rendering itself, for showing itself. 
in general, a Python code should make the decisions, this is validate the data, decide whether to proceed or not, to which page uh, you should go, and compute the data. And the page uh, should have all the responsibility for customizing the layout. So the template should have the intelligence for adapting to the specific data. For example, as we said be uh, before, in the home page, uh, we would like to avoid showing this form if the user is already logged in. So if I go back to the home page, so for example, in the data, in the data page, I add a link to the home and I delete this. Um, what is that? I should hide this if uh, the user data is defined. Hmm? So, if uh, session session the of uh, username no let's make it this way if username in session should work we are checking whether the key username is in the session dictionary I'm not sure 100% that work is going to work, but we'll see it. And this. So this form will only show you see that it doesn't show here. Let's try to restart the browser. Okay, because remember the cookie, sorry. I want to invalidate the cookie, so I change the secret key. We're starting the browser, the server. No, something is wrong here. Is it an administration? Oh, okay, not. It's a... Okay, uh, sorry. I don't remember how to. Uh, in the that's what I did I forgot the quote
Okay, so it should work now, probably. So the first time I can enter the name, see my secret data, and then if I go back, I don't see the form for entering the data anymore. How did I do that? I just checked in the home template if the session, remember it's a dictionary, did contain the key username with any value. We don't care about the value. Is the key there or not? So if the key is not there, then the user is not logged in. It didn't give us our name, so we need to ask the name for him. If uh, the uh, converse, if the username is already defined in the section, we should not provide that, and we should pro probably provide something else. Saying, for example, else, we could say, welcome back. Since we have the name, we can use it. And so maybe we should have a login, a logout button here. And the logout would uh, just destroy with a delete statement, delete uh, session username so that the application will understand that the session is expired and so on. So we can manage uh, the, the state of the web application. The, the application understands what the user did and remembers part of what the user did by managing properly the session object, the session dictionary. Okay, so this helps us, these are, you know, you are, we have the ingredients, the basic ingredient to do any kind of uh, simple interactive application. The next step uh, we need to do, well, we need now to do steps in two directions. One is uh, linking this application with a database so that we can work on real data. And the other is improving the interface, making it nicer, making it responsive, making it clickable, and so and dynamic also on the on the client side. Okay. Any questions? So that's all for tonight. Thank you.